and the new relevant information that is going to impact how you're making your current decisions. So he said, rather than try to set it up all in advance and then stick to it as if it's set in stone, just go towards what you love okay, and what you enjoy and the rest will fall into place. What's up guys, John Anthony here from John Anthony Lifestyle. Today I want to talk about how to make future life decisions, future life choices, which career you should pursue, which different major life choices and, and paths you should pursue. Okay, guys are always asking me this question. I received very good advice from my favorite and smartest college professor, which I'm going to share with you today in this video. Okay, but if you'd like to master this game and get extremely good, much more higher quantity and quality than you're used to very, very, very fast to the tune of about five to 10 dates a week, starting by week two, which is what a lot of guys are doing, uh, to the tune of sleeping with one to two new girls a week, starting by week two as well, out of these eight weeks in the program and putting about one new rotation girl on per week. You are just moments away, okay, literally about a week away, from getting very good very fast. Jump on a free 30 minute call and me or one of my coaches will talk to you about how we can help you and get you very good at this game very fast, okay? Also, if you're new to the channel or not yet a subscriber, we offer straightforward, no bullshit, practical dating advice that's going to help you really master this game very quickly. So press the subscribe button and the notification bell to be alerted of those new videos every single day, okay? Usually around 2 p.m. Eastern. So. Uh, I had this philosophy professor. I took him for intro to philosophy. I ended up taking a bunch of graduate level philosophy courses with him as well. He was the smartest professor I ever had. And I said, I can't decide. At that time I was, I was studying computer science only. So I really like programming, but I, I want to major in philosophy as well. But I also like cognitive science and psychology and this and that. I said, I can't decide what kind of career I want to pursue. And I can't decide what kind of different important life choices to make uh, going forward for the future. And he said to me, don't try to set up everything all at once in advance. Okay, meaning don't try to say like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a fireman or, you know, whatever the fuck. And then that's set in stone. And now you must do all these things to, to go towards that, even if you end up losing interest in that field or, or other things come up that you prefer, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, as new information comes in throughout your life, it could alter you know, how much you wanna do this or that profession or make this or that choice. Okay, and there could be better alternatives that are presented and the new relevant information that is going to impact how you're making your current decisions. So he said, rather than try to set it up all in advance and then stick to it as if it's set in stone, just go towards what you love Okay, and what you enjoy, and the rest will fall into place. Okay, and that was incredibly amazing advice, and that's exactly what I did. Okay, so I started off computer science. I wanted to major in philosophy because I really liked that. My parents were paying for half of my undergraduate in school, and I said, hey, I want to switch to philosophy. And they said, hey, if you don't keep your computer science major, which is a lot more practical, we're not going to keep helping with paying half. Okay, so I ended up switching schools so I can incorporate a double major because the technology school I was at, the tech school did not have a philosophy major, nor did it have double majors. Okay. So, and, and now both those things have changed. I helped champion a, a philosophy program there and they also have double majors there. But I had to switch schools and I tacked on philosophy. So then I was pursuing a double bachelor's in philosophy and computer science. But then I got very into cognitive science. So I turned that into a minor. Okay. As I got towards the end of undergraduate, I didn't really feel like being a programmer. Programming was kind of tedious. It was a bit boring, a bit too meticulous. And it could be downright frustrating when you're working on large scale programs and there's just one or two logical errors so the code is compiling properly and you can be banging your head against the wall for days at a time, not able to figure out where this mistake is. And I said, I don't really want to work with that, um, but I do really like philosophy and I do really like cognitive science a lot. So. And in psychology and this and that. And I was in an artificial intelligence course in my last year of undergraduate. And the professor said there's this new program starting at a different school called Human Computer Interaction, okay, where they fuse, uh, it's basically fusing philosophy, cognitive science, psychology, information science, graphic design, et cetera. It's basically how humans interact with computing systems, the cognitive aspects, the behavioral aspects, et cetera. And it's basically a cognitive psychology applied to software and systems. So I thought this is an opportunity to raise, well, first of all, raise my starting pay, 
go out in the industry working as a, a user experience designer or researcher and also incorporate my interests in the brain sciences okay and not just be a, a strict programmer okay but as i got towards the end of that i did that program half the time the undergraduate i finished in four years instead of five because it was two bachelor's and a minor I'm supposed to take five years at least i did that in four years then i entered this human computer interaction program that was supposed to be two years i did that in one year and as i got towards the end of that i thought hmm a lot of this stuff is kind of common sense. What I do really like still is philosophy and cognitive science. So I went on Google, typed philosophy, cognitive science, masters, and I found a program in England at the University of Sussex in Brighton, England. And that was dealing with philosophy of cognitive science. So we were studying the nature of concepts and consciousness and really looking from a top-down perspective, what are the results and findings of cognitive science and how can we analyze those in a philosophical setting? But as I was going through that program, again, I, I did that one in one year uh, in the UK. As I was going through that, there was too much top-down speculation. Okay, consciousness seems to be this, or, or different cognitive phenomena seem to be this. Whereas I was already very well versed in the neuroscientific and cognitive scientific aspects of that field from having read a bunch of books on the side. I read, read about 30 neuroscience and cognitive science books by that time. I, that was a big hobby of mine on the side as well as poker books. And, you know, I ended up, I was always making these arguments in the philosophy class. Well, this has actually been resolved from a bottom up empirical perspective. It's been resolved objectively. So from there, it was just too much at odds. I was favoring the scientific aspect because they were actually solving these problems from the bottom up, whereas the, phil the philosophers were just sitting kind of in an armchair setting saying, oh, well, well, it seems to be this and it seems to be this without a lot of nitty gritty objective empirical data to back up their positions, which is a lot stronger, okay, when you have direct empirical real data, tangible data. So as I got to the talent of that, I thought, okay, well, what am I going to fucking do now, okay? Um, I debated going to law school to become a patent attorney because I still really liked arguing and I wanted to leverage uh, my abilities to analyze and break down things and, and make solid deductive and rational arguments and empirical arguments too. And I thought that the law field would be good for that. So I took the LSAT, got into a good law program, and I ended up backing out last minute because as I did more research into the law field, I found they're working long hours. It's a lot of meticulous work. It's a lot of potentially boring work. The, the job placement rate isn't that high. Uh, the stress levels are very high. Depression rates are high. Satisfaction in the, in the career is, is not the best, etc. And so I've been in that. Okay, so as you can see, I went all these different directions. But if I said, oh, I'm just going to be a programmer. And then as I lost interest in programming, you know, as, as a full-time profession, rather than adhere to that and say, oh, I, you know, I said I was going to be a programmer, so I'm doing that. Or I said I'm switching to philosophy, so now I'm taking that route. And also I, I explored looking into doing a PhD in philosophy as well at the University of Edinburgh. And I planned on, that was going to be a three-year PhD program. So I was going to have... Uh, I finished my two masters and two bachelors by age 23. I was going to do the, the law degree, the JD by 26, and then the PhD in the UK in philosophy of mind. And I was going to have PhD, JD, double masters, double bachelors, and a minor by 29. And that, that, so that was the goal at one point. But uh, being a cognitive science researcher or a philosophy, doing a PhD in philosophy and having to be a professor, which is one of the only viable options for a philosophy degree in our capitalistic society, those options did not seem to be the best either, just because of the, those fields are not advantageous to capitalism. And at the end of the day, I didn't want to be living, you know, scrounging to survive and this and that. Plus, the, with the philosophy professor thing, I'd be teaching teaching a lot of people that had a naive understanding of the subject matter and a lot of them didn't, wouldn't even want to be there, etc. So long story short, uh, I ended up still pursuing job prospects using my master's degrees and I was at a conference in Montreal where I, I talked to a representative from Lockheed Martin, which is a private defense contractor, the biggest defense contractor for the U.S. government. It's Department of Defense Contracts and they ended up offering me a job and so I ended up, ended up going into uh, work on the ballistic missile defense for nuclear, biological, and chemical missile defense. My job for five years was to optimize the speed of response time and the accuracy of response against a nuclear, biological, or chemical missile attack against the U.S. or our allies. It was for the, for the Navy division. I wasn't in the Navy, but I was a, a private defense contractor working on Navy contracts. And the Earth is two-thirds water, and most of the populations are on coastal areas, the big populations. So it's arguably one of the most important branches of the military. And I was able to drive in key improvements that radically upgraded those systems okay, at, a, at a young age. After about five years there, okay, now my parents were just thrilled with this job. Okay, you know, build up a retirement fund and just 
start a family there. And that's why I was living in Philadelphia, working out there. Again, go towards what I enjoyed, or I was enjoying at the time. However, IBM came along and said, we'll pay you 50% more to work from home. So I took that job, okay, to my parents' despair. And I ended up leading a team of about 30 programmers, uh, heading up the UX efforts, the user experience efforts. And then I later did small stints at um, a company in Vegas, okay, the, in, a company based out of India, and Hewlett Packard in California and, and Sony PlayStation. Okay, but I was fired from Sony PlayStation, Hewlett Packard, and IBM, all for coming in late, missing meetings, et cetera. Basically, I would, I would prioritize game at this point over those things, and my game was getting extremely good, and my coaching was getting very good. And after I got fired from Hewlett Packard, I just went straight full at this profession in this field doing the dating stuff. Okay, and now I'm happier than I could have ever dreamed. Okay, I don't have, I'm my own boss. I work with the thing that I love the most, which is the, the pickup and seduction game. I was able to break the whole game down extremely systematically and analytically, uh, treating it just like how I mastered poker, just like how I mastered chess, okay, just like how I, how I got very good with computer science and with engineering and this kind of stuff. My official title at Lockheed Martin was a systems engineer. And the, the point of sharing this journey with you through academia and this and that is it was not clear at all when I started off as a programmer that I would end up as a dating coach. Okay. It was not clear at all when I started off as a programmer that I would have an interest in philosophy or in cognitive science or that I'd be working for these, these top uh, you know, mega companies that are pretty prestigious. And you know, m most people that I met at the Lockheed Martin job, they're still there. They're, they're just going to work there until they're retired. Okay. Most people that do anything in life, they just have this one track kind of narrow focus. They just work their way up the corporate ladder. They're kind of on autopilot, et cetera, et cetera. I also wasn't afraid to travel. I got to live all around the world throughout you know, the, my experience as a dating coach and also when I had the, the work from home job with IBM. And I valued being able to travel and do what I want to do when I want to do it, okay? Because life is short and you want to maximize you know, the time you're putting into things and the output that it, that it produces. And lots of guys would kill to have the life that I have. Okay, now I'm living on a tropical island with 42 beaches in a two-story penthouse. There's three beautiful Brazilian girls that I'm very close with that live with me. Um, you know, I get to help guys every single day get rock star level dating results. Okay, it's very rare that I don't get a guy very good very fast. I have the system, I have by far the best system in the world. At, at dating, and when I showed my lay count graph, you see a smooth exponential progression where it took about 10 years to hit the first 100 girls. Then it was about 100 to 150 girls a year for a while, and the best year was 246. And you know, it, it's really satisfying to have built a system that that progressively improved at an exponential rate, and to be able to present it to guys on a silver platter where they can just plug in and it's all centered on efficient, efficiency, effectiveness, optimization, speed of implementation, okay, how straightforward and easy to assimilate it is. And guys are able to just plug in and start absolutely destroying it, okay? So that was my own personal journey and I hope that that quote is inspiring and my own personal journey is, is inspiring so that for those of you that are watching that aren't sure what you wanna do as your occupation, that aren't sure where you wanna live, that aren't sure where, you know, any kind of these life choices, buy a house, this or that. Just go use the information that you have at the time, which is exactly how you should make your decisions in game, and exactly how you should make your decisions in poker and any of these things, any game of incomplete information. You go off what seems to make the most sense at the time, with all things considered, weighing all the pros and cons. As new information comes in, then you reassess, and then you make the appropriate changes, and you have to be brave, you have to be willing to go, my mother told me that, uh, people that study philosophy are deadbeats that couldn't make it in any other profession, which to quite the contrary, those are the smartest and, you know, people I respected the most by far that I've ever met in my life, those philosophy professors that, you know, uh, basically abandoned career, successful careers they could have had in, in technology or all these things. These are very bright people to work in the dating, or sorry, to work in the philosophy field and make a lot less money but to do something that they love, okay? And philosophers are extremely intelligent in, in general, for the most part, in that those skills that I learned there in terms of how I was able to analyze problems and break things down into their constituent parts and communicate clearly and effectively and, and weigh all sides of issues and stuff like this, those things were invaluable and, and I use those on a daily basis to this day, okay? So I hope you guys that are watching don't feel uh, over, um, as overwhelmed as you did before watching this video in terms of what are you going to do with your life? What are the major things that, that you should decide on now? 
Um, it's the same thing in a cold approach interaction. I tell guys who are making a real-time probabilistic assessment of the odds of being able to take that particular girl home. And if the odds seem low or if it seems like a non-starter, at any point as new information comes in, then you cut bait. Okay, and you move on to the next one. So as new information comes in, you have to be like, boom, okay, this program is in England, all right, I'm moving to England. Everyone's like, you're not gonna fucking move to England, I moved to England, okay? Or hey, I went to give a talk in Poland to this 300 uh, crowd event, 300 person event, and I loved it there, so I stayed for a year and a half. I came to Brazil for carnival, for a vacation, I loved it, so I stayed, okay? I stopped in Portugal on the way back from living in Ukraine, I stopped in Portugal for a day to see one of my buddies, met this Brazilian stripper, ended up staying there for months, okay? And so on and so forth, and, and so life can just be one big adventure, and as things come up, don't be a fucking pussy. Don't be afraid to go and, and step outside the bounds. And if you fail miserably, worst case scenario, it's not going to be the end of the world. You'll still get back up on your feet. You'll still be able to have a successful life in one regard or another. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. If you want to master this dating game and get extremely good, extremely fast, I'm your man. As you see from my educational background, I'm extremely intellectual and capable of taking a systematic approach, which is exactly what I did. I broke the entire game down into a macro system where you have lead acquisition with online night and day game. Okay, that's all leading down into phone numbers. I show you exactly how to text to set up public dates and dates straight to the house. Show how to run your dates and close your dates and lastly how to retain the girls. And each of those eight weeks of that eight week mentorship has a whole micro system behind it. Okay, so I encourage you to not delay. Jump on that free 30 minute call because spots are limited and we'll show you how we can get you very good very fast. Also, if you're not yet a subscriber, please subscribe below. Hope this video is helpful. Like, comment, and share. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you. I'm John Anthony and have a good one. Take care. Some do it for the income, but we do it for the outcome. Some of us are active while others just let their mouth run. No doubt, son, this is not just about fun. We will not be outdone by these cowards who shout scum.